Um, okay, so uh, we're going to dive right in to chapter one, which was an introduction to the text. Um, and in that introduction, it really focused on defining and spending a lot of time looking at that universal tier. So defining universal tier, looking at the evolution of the universal tier um, over time, um, thinking about the barriers and the challenges to the universal tier, and also um, what the primary quality components are of that universal tier. This is, this is an important um, foundation to start from um, because if you've been in trainings with me before, you, you know that I do talk a lot about the importance of that tier one and really thinking about the work and the decision making and the database decision making that goes into um, into enhancing the instruction in that tier one. And sometimes I find that it can sound a lot like I'm implying that we shouldn't be putting a lot of focus in on tiers two and tier three. And that can that can feel like you know, that can feel weird sometimes. Um, and, and just so, but just know from, from my perspective, it's not that I think that we should be eliminated our, our, our small group and our individual sports for students is not that at all. Um, though that, that is obviously vitally important for the success of our, of our students and their growth and their achievement. What I, what I really think that we need to add on to that though, is are some of the decisions that we're making in those tiers the tier two and the tier three, are they truly building upon a foundational tier one that can support those decisions? And so are we really looking at the decisions that we're making in that foundational tier one so that the decisions that we do make at tiers two and tier three for these students that need intensified instruction, intensified intervention, that they are actually getting a supplemental dose of instruction and, and intervention um, and not running into that supplanting of instruction and intervention, right? And so really spending some time thinking about what are the components of that universal tier that should be helping me to inform the decisions that I make at those upper tiers as well. Okay, welcome back. Welcome back. I had an opportunity to jump into a couple of different rooms. So um, I love listening in on the different conversations and kind of hearing how folks are um, interpreting the the information in the text and applying it to their unique situations. It always, I don't know, I had a lot of fun in the January text discussion. And so I was really looking forward to today because I was like, oh, it's always so fun. Um, okay, so very good. So, um, what we'll do now is we'll come together as a group and um, hopefully folks will be um, willing to uh, speak up as to what their group talked about and we will get an idea of kind of um, what the overall impressions and takeaways were from chapter one of the text. So I'm going to stop talking so that you guys can take over the floor. Thank you, Teresa. Um, our group was just talking about, um, we were introducing ourselves and talking about where we are in, in the process and um, we're all in different places within the MTSS and we just talked a little bit about um, data collection and what that might look like and what we use for, for doing that data collection for our tiers and we talked about what process and procedures we had in place for evaluating tier one uh, curriculum and instruction. Did I get it guys? Is that it? All right. Okay, and I was with um, Janice and Kylie and they are both from the same district and um, they were sharing their insights around um, the new programs that have been um, adopted and just uh, the, the reading program that was adopted had more input from the teaching staff. And I was just curious because we'll be getting ready to do that. Um, and Janice said that they ha actually had a guide that was used um, to, to make sure that the materials selected met the criteria. We talked about how timely this book is for all of us, even though we're in different places, just because of the universal tier piece. Um, and I just shared out that, and Janice and I were talking about how a, a number of students are being placed in interventions, so many so, and I think this book addressed it as well, that it, we have to pause 
probably stop, never mind pause, and go back to like, what's the universal instruction? What is it that we want our kids to know and be able to do? Because, uh, you know, our small Title I staff, for example, can't have over 50% of the students in the school. Like, they just can't. So um, it, was, it was a good discussion, and it was good to hear from, from their perspective as to how things had been done. Did I miss anything, Janice, Kylie? Okay. Nope. Uh, my name is Rachel and I can report out from what I think was group three on, I'm not totally sure on the number. Um, I was in a group with, I think three principals, I know at least two principals and Doug, I seem like maybe you're also a principal. Um, I'm a faculty member at the University of Southern Maine. So I ended up taking notes since I don't technically have core in the same way. Um, and we uh, um, talked through two of the questions. One was, um, how do we define tier one core? Um, and um, the major theme I think um, that folks um, identified was a real need to revisit and redefine what constitutes core instruction, recognizing that curriculum and program are not the same thing. Yeah. And that our responsibility is to provide you know, our adopted curriculum, and that sometimes we may also adopt programs, but that they're not identical. And it's very important to make sure that teachers get some training. The other thing um, that was a focus is just as someone else reflected on the critical importance of teachers appreciating why tier one must be super effective, which essentially goes to the resource issue of, as someone said, you can't have 50% of your kids in tier two or tier three. It just won't ever work. Um, and so really helping teachers to understand tier one, and I really like this comment and a couple of people had it, um, without offending them. Um, and I think that really gets at the fact that so many teachers are so stressed. Um, then the other um, thing that we talked about had to do with um, how to identify and, and select evidence-based and research-based materials for tier one. Um, and um, one of the buildings has used ESSER money, and I really liked this idea, um, to purchase some new resources on a small scale, let teachers try them out, because that way it's not a huge commitment. And I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Um, and then um, we also chatted about the critical importance of training and that you can't do too much too fast and you got to go slow to go fast. And so rolling out just one content area per year probably is the max because folks just feel like they can't do anything more. Um, and then the challenge of helping teachers understand what is meant by evidence-based and research-based materials and that teachers pay teachers doesn't necessarily reflect that type, that idea of research-based or evidence-based. So I think we shared um, a lot of the same challenges and concerns while talking through some steps, you know, to move in that direction. Others are welcome to chime in as well. Rachel, I think you bring up a really good point about the, um, that your group was talking about, about the without offending them, because this topic does tend to come up, um, particularly when working with schools on tier one decision-making, tier one database decision-making, and how that conversation, when you finally drill down into what area it is that you are, that you're going to have to address. And a lot of times that comes down to having to connect with that classroom teacher and to discuss like what changes may have to be made at that classroom instruction level. And it can be a hard conversation. And I think you hit the nail on the head with this idea that um, not only are teachers stressed, but I mean, you know, historically teachers can sometimes, are sometimes the scapegoat of all the things that are wrong <laughs> with society. And so they were, they're used to being blamed and pointed at and, and being made to feel like they're not doing enough when they're doing five times as much as, you know, somebody in say another equally as educated profession might be in. And so it can be a very hard conversation. I think as an administrator, one of those, you know, one of those tenants of your like one of your tenants to be part of a school-wide or a full-scale MTSS is to 
is to be working on those things that would have to build that relationship, build that um, camaraderie, build that, you know, um, empathy with your educators so that you can have those conversations when they come up um, so that you can avoid that. Did that topic come up in other groups as well about um, having hard conversations with classroom level educators in terms of changes that might have to be made to their tier one? We did talk a bit about the common core standards, state standards, and how we used to, in the past, we used to uh, map our curriculum. And we may have to go back to that to make sure that we are meeting those standards. You're right. A program is not necessarily the curriculum. You have to make sure that everything that you need to teach is taught somehow in that, in all the grade spans. And it's got to, you've got to have a, a crop, you've got to kind of have it mapped out in such a way that you see what's being taught at every level. And to me, that's how you, you strengthen your core, your core instruction is by knowing what you need to teach at each grade level. And whether you're following the whole pro, a, a whole program or not, sometimes you're gonna supplement one way or the other. There's something missing, you gotta know when to supplement and you have to know mm -hmm. when to let, to release something that's not needed. Uh, but it's important to be able to map the whole thing out so that you can focus on what the standards are and, and how we're gonna address all of them. And no, you can't teach every single one separately, but there are ways to kind of combine them so that you can meet those standards. Because if you try to do every little one that is a little snapshot, that doesn't work. You've gotta be able to bring them through and then revisit and, and bring more through and revisit some more. So it, it's important to have that everybody have a good understanding of what that tier one core instruction is. And it's hard when you're always changing um, programs. And I don't mm -hmm. know if it, other districts have been in this quagmire, but during the pandemic, any new program that you chose, it was hard to get proper training because it was all online. So you didn't have mm -hmm. anybody coming in to roll out, uh, giving you help to unroll and unpack something. It was different because you were in your own district and you didn't have the people right there. And it's very difficult, very yeah. different. So now we're trying to step back and look again at how we can make that better for everybody. Yeah, you bring up a couple of good points. Um, bye. Um, you bring up a couple of good points. Um, one being that when you when you are able to look at that curriculum map over grades, you open up a really great opportunity to do some vertical teaming, so that when you are working on um, you know um, different components of different standards at the same time, like you can look at opportunities for how to provide intensified instruction, intervention, supplemental um, opportunities, you know, by using some vertical teaming. And then the second point that you brought up has completely left my brain. It'll come back. <laughs> um, but you had another point there too that I was like, oh, actually, that's a really good point to kind of to kind of pull out as well. Um, but uh, maybe Andrea, it'll come back to Andrea. Me. Yeah, I was hoping to share too that um, I think probably you know you brought up a great point about building the relationships and the empathy with staff, which is absolutely critical now, especially post COVID. Um, but I had shared too that I think you know um, your inroad would be making sure they understand this is not something that's added to the plate. I've heard another thing on the plate ad nauseum. And I think, you know, if there is a way to help folks let go of some of the things that they've always done um, and just understand that it's working in a different way, I think that that's probably going to be a beneficial inroad. But boy, people do tend to let go uh, kicking and screaming sometimes. So that can be a challenge. But I think framing it in that way would be would be very effective. Yeah, that's another really good point. Um, and and I do hear that come up, you know, when I'm talking with administrators particularly in this feeling that, you know, that when thinking about, oh, well, we're not doing RTI anymore, we're doing MTSS now. And it's like, well, they're kind of, you know, they 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 are they're, they're intertwined, they're mixed in. The RTI is a form of MTSS, but you know, what we're really thinking is instead of is really looking at um, take that RTI and the skills that you have with RTI and sort of like opening up that lens and thinking about how can we widen that lens to that whole school approach, really incorporating more of a tier one into that, which I think is sort of that can be one of those lines between like a, 
you know, targeted RTI discussion versus like an MTSS discussion. And so it's not a new thing. We're not switching what we're doing. We're really just taking some of the skills that we've gained and applying it in, you know, in a way that is going to be able to address more students um, with the same level of resources, because there's never going to be enough resources um, to be able to meet all the needs, especially, you know, with the in the direction that we have been tending to go in. And the other thought that I had um, in, in response to um, the, last, the last person was that in terms of standards, and sometimes I think one thing that tends to emerge through discussion is that folks often feel like MTSS or intervention programming or intervention systems are competing with our ability to reach the standards because it's like, how do we slow down all of these things that we're trying to reach? You know, state standards, I got to teach this, 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 this. How am I supposed to slow down enough? How am I supposed to work this in when I've got all these things on my plate that I already have to do? And so thinking about um, where is the where's the line there between competing against, you know, standards and um, providing additional support for students versus, you know, trying to help make the systems work together, which I think is one of those areas of um, theory and practice that often, you know, that often comes a conversation because it's hard. It's hard to navigate that. Um, okay, I do want to try to stay on time as much as possible. So um, thank you for that discussion in chapter one. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, focus your attention towards chapter four. So determining the effectiveness of universal instruction. And um, and so this this chapter really starts off by asking like asking us like how do we know how do we know that the universal instruction um, that students are receiving is effective. What what are some of the things that you're looking for when you are trying to determine if the instruction is effective? Um, what it, what are the look for? What what are the things that you're listening for? What trends? What type of data are you looking at? And um, when you see something or you hear something that gives pause, like what other pieces of information do you look for to try and supplement it so that you can answer that question? And then when you take that, when you finally formulate that question of how well is this instruction working, um, figuring out where you're gonna go from there in terms of determining how to identify if there's a problem, how are you going to address that problem and what is gonna be like this, the, the process that you take in order to address that. Um, and so what I'll do is I will send you off um, into new groups um, and you'll be there for roughly 18 minutes for this one because I think we are just a few minutes over, but that's okay. Um, what we'll do is we'll just go out for 18 minutes and then when we come back for the whole group discussion, um, if you haven't had an opportunity to take a break yet, feel free to do so. Um, and then we will um, enter a new round of breakout rooms. I had it written down um, at, 15. So if you come, if you if you do your break in between this small group and the next whole group, we will enter the third round of breakout room at 5:15. So it's just kind of give you an idea of where we're headed with this. Um, okay, so I will send you off, and I can't wait to pop in and hear some of the conversation. Um, so what I thought we would do is uh, do our quick little. Um, it'll be a looks like a roughly 11 minute share out right now um, of chapter four, kind of like th your thoughts, where you got started. And then um, the good news is chapter five actually is um, sort of like a part two to chapter four. And so when you're thinking about your, um, you know, when you're asking that overall question of, you know, like, how do we know if tier one instruction is working? Um, chapter five really gets us into the identifying the barriers, right? And so like some of the things that may come up in that discussion. So hopefully you'll find that it will come full circle um, towards the end of the discussion. So, um, okay, so chapter four, determining the effectiveness of universal instruction. Um, interested to hear um, what sort of themes and topics came up in your breakout rooms. And I'll stop talking so that you guys can take the floor. I can speak for our group. We didn't get too far in that chapter because we kind of got stuck on uh, page 74, um, the universal tier questions. So it really helps us to kind of broaden our perspective of looking at data um, in different ways. And one being, you know, the 80% of students that we all are aware of, but um, we had more of a conversation about the second question um, at looking at our students that are at 80% and are 95% of those students still uh, meeting the expectations in the fall, which then we started talking about those other learners that tend to be on the higher end and 
what the impact is and why they, yes, they're meeting, they're above, they're in the 90 something percentile, but they're not meeting necessarily their targeted growth. And so we had a deeper conversation where at the tier one level is that cause maybe an impact um, you mm -hmm. know, for example, if, you know, if they're given materials and projects and activities to do that are at above level, but they can do it independently, is that really stretching their learning? Um, and they still need direct instruction. So, mm -hmm. but we need to take our, you know, lower students because we want them to progress. So they don't, the students at the higher end don't always, upper end don't always get as much direct instruction to push them for, um, further up. Um, and then one of the, um, just, um, it was, who was, where's, uh, Dawn talked about, you know, she asked her special ed director about the rate of students identified as having a learning disability um, for her, their district. Is it at the same, below the state average? Um, and if it's above, are we missing out on that tier, different tier level of interventions and supports, and they're just going right into special ed um, is it you know so there's a lot of if they're above the state average why asking those questions and why right did I miss anything Any questions all right next Your turn, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> My dogs are circling behind me. They think it's oh. dinner time. So um, we actually, I was with Emily and Mark. Sure. Thank you, Dawn, for the intro. So it's my, um, and we were discussing um, progress monitoring, which was really interesting um, in terms of how do you kind of like the means to know what what if, if universal instruction is working and honestly i didn't say this but i'm just thinking that's one thing that i kept thinking about as i was reading this book is i don't know that i've ever looked at progress monitoring even though i don't believe we have a firm um system in place as checking to see if the programming is working i think we've always been like oh well if the students aren't meeting these needs then they must need more intervention. So it was just, it was a good conversation. Can I just add to Teresa's, I wasn't in her group, but just thinking about progress monitoring. The other question is, is the progress monitoring you're using matching up with the interventions you're providing? Sometimes we do progress monitoring, but it's not even really on the focus of the intervention to really know if that is making a difference. Thank you for bringing that up because that is, we do a lot of comparing apples to oranges. Um, and that comes up a lot in discussions um, when we're looking at the fact that data has a shelf life, right? So if you've taken the, pro if you've progress monitored, you've collected some data, and if you haven't made a decision using that data within three to five days, your data is no longer valid because so much is going to happen in that amount of time. And so, you know, and that's one of those um, big overarching themes that comes up when we think of like state assessment, right? A lot of people are like, oh, state assessment doesn't matter because we can't use that information, you know, to make decisions um, because it's, you know, it's so old or it, it takes so long to get it back, like that kind of thing, which I think is completely valid. I think really what it's good for is just sort of that, again, that snapshot of how are things going, you know, longitudinally over time, not necessarily for making, you know, um, you, you've got other data that can help you make so many more like good decisions about which direction to take your instruction, which direction to take your professional development, things like that. Um, but yeah, so thanks for bringing that up because that is a big topic about, you know, what are you measuring and do you think you're, are you measuring what you think you're measuring <laughs> um, when you're measuring it? Yeah, good point. Um, other thoughts that came up. Um, one of the things that we talked about when uh, looking at the effectiveness of our universal universal tier was ultimately the testing, the assessments that we have to that we have to do. Um, if the kids 
overall are 80% or higher, then we're doing pretty well. That's what goes on in our minds. Yes, progress monitoring is happening on the at the classroom level um, and decisions are made based on that. But every time we have, because we are one, um, one teacher per grade, so when we've got a class that's not performing, um, we're taking a look at what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. So. Are there others on the screen that experience that as well? Like one teacher, one grade? Because that's pretty typical in main schools like the one teacher, one grade um, conundrum. Yeah, John? We have one teacher, one grade in one of my schools, but then we have one teacher, two grades in the other three of my schools. So oh, one teacher okay. teaches first, second, one, three, four, one, five, six. Are they multi-age rooms? Yep. Yeah, okay, okay. One of the other things we did talk about was the fact that, um, we use this to determine how how things are going in the classroom. Um, but it's also the teachers have all of their data. They keep track of their data. Um, um, we talked about, you know, data walls and what else is going on. But we have one teacher per grade. So they have everything. They share everything with me. And, you know, they have a good idea of what's going on with their kids. The struggle mm -hmm. becomes when you've got a class of 25, how do you make sure to meet that you're meeting all of their needs? Any others experiencing similar configurations? We talked about that too, with the, just the one grade in the school and someone, someone in another conversation in another group I had said, well, maybe some of those kids, maybe, you know, we need to talk about maybe all those kids aren't in third grade. Maybe some mm -hmm. of them, you know, like the no walls concept of kids just are where they are. And if second grade has 15 kids and third grade has 25 kids, then maybe you could be flexible, but maybe some of those, I know telling parents that will be so traumatic, I'm sure, but like just be flexible about the groupings. I'm maybe, I don't know, just thinking out loud. That topic actually came up in a discussion that I had earlier today with the um, ele elementary math specialist um, here. We were having a discussion and and, you know, and, and this idea of, you know, when you're looking at your tier one, your tier one data, and you're trying to make some decisions about your tier one data, and that when we're really thinking of like an impactful school-wide MTSS, you know, we're making decisions on the students that we have in front of us at that moment in time, and where they are with their skills and their knowledge at that moment in time. And so if you've got a second grade teacher that is looking at a group of students that are now in second grade, but they, you know, you've got only 40% meeting or exceeding, you know, benchmarks or like are prepared for and ready for second grade curriculum, that teacher has to it really has to think of themselves as more of a teacher of that grade and the span that's within that grade. And, and, and what we tend to sometimes do or what it comes and, and has sometimes like emerged is, well, I'm just going to teach the kids that are ready for the second grade, and then someone else is going to come in and provide support for those that are not ready, and we're going to support them along. How do you meet, how do you change the paradigm there? Is there a shift that has to happen so that that second grade teacher realizes that, yes, I teach at a second grade level in terms of age appropriateness, but in terms of instructional appropriateness, I might be teaching first grade and really thinking about how you know, how that dynamic plays out in, in the minds of educators and in parents, like someone just brought up this idea of. And then I think if you, if you, if we were to think about it from that internal perspective, um, that discussion with the parent maybe wouldn't have, wouldn't be as traumatic, right? Because we would be, we would be addressing it from an internal point of view rather than, you know, labeling students as, well, your student is still only a first grader or is only functioning at first grade. Like your student is a second grader and we're meeting their needs instructionally by doing, X, Y, and Z, you know, whatever it is, that instructional 
those instructional leads are. Were there any other pressing thoughts that came up from chapter four or do we wanna get back in um, to chapter five? Go ahead, Emily. My, my pressing thought is from the lens of an instructional coach with a gifted and talented or high ability learner coach, that, that lens, mm -hmm. just I highlighted it. on Kindle. So it's a different page number, I think, than yours. But it was, there is little reason to use a different screening measure for the universal tier than is used for identifying individual student needs. And that Where made, did you read that, Emily? I'm sorry. Now, on my Kindle, it's page 104. Oh. So I think it's going to be before page 104 on the text version, because I noticed when you said questions on page 18, it was page 37 on my Kindle. So that said, okay. why that struck me was um, when you look at, say, a student who is not making growth, like I was just pouring over our winter NWEAs and noticing students with high achievement and low growth, and then when I combine that with what I know about the student using ability measures, those mm -hmm. often are, are you know, high ability students, not only their high achievement, but their low growth. Um, so anyway, I'm just suggesting that another universal screener that we want to consider is perhaps an ability screener, but that takes us down a whole different path. And I understand that, you know, the focus of this discussion is more on achievement. And that certainly you can have a student with high achievement and lower ability than a gifted and talented student. And they do need something different and they do need to be a tier three student as well. But I just wanted to throw that mm -hmm. out. Um, other universal screeners could be considered. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you did because, you know, certainly as we have more and more discussions about um, how, you know, like the the gifted and talented perspective fits into a full scale MTSS, I think those are going to be um, those are going to be, you know, viewpoints that are going to be vital to these discussions so that we can ensure that we're really looking at that entire continuum and then making decisions based on how we're going to meet the needs of that entire continuum. So thank you. That's that's a very important point to bring up. Okay, next question is because I know folks will really dig deep into their chapter four discussions. Do you want to remain in the same groups for chapter five so you can pick up and continue where you left off? Or would you rather um, be mixed up again like we would have normally done for chapter five? And if you if you don't care, then you can just not care. Like, I mean, unless you have like a strong feeling for, of one or the other. But I did, I did want to toss that out there. Okay, so I'm going to assume that there's not a very strong feeling for one or the other. So we'll just keep it the way we normally do and that's to recreate the breakout room. Um, and that's good though, because whatever you were talking about in your previous group, you could bring into the discussion with your new group. Hey, welcome back, welcome back. Okay, so chapter Five, um, a big extension to chapter four in terms of chapter four is asking like, how do we know? And then um, chapter five being like, what are some of the barriers that could be getting in the way of this thing happening? And then we are actually going to move into chapter six in a few minutes where we start talking about um, some of the action planning that would need to happen in order to address some of those barriers. So once you sort of ask the question and try to figure out like, what are some of the barriers? Which of those barriers are something that I actually have an opportunity to provide you know, some problem solving too, so that I could figure out what to do with this barrier and how am I going to action plan um, through and or around that barrier. Were there any big ideas that came out of the chapter five discussion um, before we uh, move on to chapter six? I'll speak for our group. <laughs> I was trying to get Kylie to uh, do the uh, information, but we kind of focused on the identifying pri and prioritizing barriers mm -hmm. that'll allow for schools to develop action plans. Mm -hmm. We were. Um, what were some of the discussion you had around that, Elizabeth? Well, and I think for her district, some of that is they have new programs that have been implemented in. So when we look at the barriers, some of it is how much we are being required to do and then what to take off. And we're not sure what to take off the plate. 
that would help mm. alleviate some of those barriers because I feel like right now we're in a pretty critical time in our educational system where everything is a priority. Behavior, social, emotional, academics, everything. And I don't, you know, equity. And I don't think I've ever felt like that. That's where we have ever been before, where everything has to be at the forefront to meet the students' needs. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then some of those barriers that are, even as administrators, not in our ability to change because it has to be, it sometimes equals money. If you want to, like my building, I have part-time um, AEs, art, music, phys ed. If we really wanted to look at scheduling that is meant for, and we've talked about this a long time in education, you know, our schedule should be built around what students need, not built around a lunch and recess schedule, not built around an AE schedule, but it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you hear the teachers saying, well, that schedule doesn't work because of this. And it's like, but I only have this person in the building this many days. It has to be this way. Mm -hmm. So um, that really does equal some money because then you're hiring people for more than just the area they're focused in. Um, so I, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Anybody can chime in their thoughts. Thank you. You got a thumbs up. Good job. I think it's an important question to ask. Like I think it's an I think it's an important topic that has to be addressed is, you know, how how do we continue to move forward with, you know, how do we see the forest through the trees kind of thing, you know, figuring out what is that path when, you know, the the forest has now become overgrown. <laughs> right. And now not only are we just trying to like keep our trails, you know, clear of you know, brush and leaves and, you know, like the, the random blowdown, you know, happening, you know, through like the winter storm versus, you know, a lot of our trails are starting to get overgrown, right? And now, because we haven't had an opportunity to really focus on make just tr regular trail maintenance, but now, like, because uh, we were diverted so many times in the last few years that those trails that we could typically rely on to be, you know, a solid path, are, are in and of themselves experiencing different obstacles that we are now finding ourselves trying to figure out how do we, how do we, you know, do we have to build a switch back? What do we do? Like, what do we do with this? Is it worth, you know, um, spending the time to chop down all those trees, all those blowdowns, or do we just try to go around the problem? And if to go around the problem, like what's the, what are the consequences for doing that? And how do we get people to come along? And what are the decisions that have to be made? That kind of thing. Yeah, that's an important line of thinking. We've got about two minutes for the rest of this discussion, unless you want to just go ahead and dive into chapter six, um, and then we can wrap up after that. Okay, great. Um, so, and as always, like when we come back, if something pops up from this discussion that you want to add, don't hesitate to add it. So like every time we come back to the whole group, you can feel free to add something from whatever it is that we've already talked about. So don't feel like you have to, you know, something um, popped in your head and you're like, oh, I wish I had said that. Just say it. <laughs> it's okay. There's, there's, there's no rule. Um, okay, so chapter six um, really digs back into that whole idea of the barriers and then the action planning that would have to happen around coming, you know, getting around those. So looking at, um, so some of the things that stuck out to me would be, you know, like uh, class-wide interventions and this idea of class-wide interventions, instructional routines and how those fit in. Um, and then really thinking about what doesn't work, what's actually working against us in terms of action planning and how do we, you know, how do we work around those things, um, if you can work around those things, um, and what do we know that we don't want to keep trying, and what could we take off the plate versus things that we want to keep on the plate and continue to nurture. Um, okay. Another thing that came up in another discussion previously, not in just in this group, but um, actually previously in this group too, was this idea of 
um, when you're coming up with hypotheses, when you're coming up with reasons, you know, well, this reason is contributing to this or this reason is contributing to that, um, make sure you take every one of those reasons and run them through the lens of, is this something that I can even change? And if it isn't something that you can even change, it needs to go, okay, yep, we addressed that. We have identified that. And now we have to set it aside and look and dig deeper into what are the things that we would be able to change. Um, I think sometimes discussions with educators tend to get stuck into these, well, we can't do anything about X, Y, or Z. Great. Let's address that. Put it on. We're going to set it over here. And then we have to start digging into what we can address um, and what kind of action steps we can take um, so that we can continue to move forward. Um, okay. So we are only in chapter six discussion for about 10 minutes. Um, so, um, what we'll do when we come back, it'll be, it'll be 5.55. We will, um, have any final thoughts that want to get shared in that last five minutes. And then, like I said, I will drop a link to the evaluation. Um, and I want to honor your time so we can get right out of here at six o'clock. So anyway, it's getting late. And if you're not already home, you probably want to get there. She says, if someone wants to get started. All right. <laughs> We talked a lot about various barriers. Let's see, um, staff, staffing came up twice. Um, a comment about technology being used to do your progress monitoring. What are you gonna use that's reliable? Um, help me out group. I know there were two other things that we mentioned for barriers, escaping my mind, I didn't write it down. Staffing. Staffing and, and staffing, enough staffing, and then um, helping change the mindset of maybe perhaps staff who are wondering, you know, if this is another thing. Am I right? I think. Anybody else? Anyone from my team? On our team, Beth, if you recall, we talked about... Um, the importance of aligning um, what we're doing to essential targets, um, making sure that that alignment is is in place. And I mentioned um, it's kind of old school backward planning, Wiggins and McTie understanding by design, um, which I love. But then, you know, a way to give people permission that when that alignment happens, if there's any anything that's additional, it'd be great if it can be used for an enhancement, but it's not. We don't have to use the curriculum page one, page two, page three, and so on. So yeah, so that came up. And then a little bit of a discussion, which we could continue on class-wide interventions versus, uh, versus differentiation as well. Did I hit everything, Beth? You did. Okay. Anybody else? And just to dovetail on that, my group talked about a little bit about, um, you know, conversations around uh, giving things up and what what can you give up and what do teachers want to give up. And there's some value in, so you have a favorite lesson that's yours and you you teach it for three days or a project or whatever, and it doesn't align to anything, we, um, you, you know, but I mean, we talked about beach day. Beach day doesn't really al align to anything and it's that instructional time. And so where do you draw the line on that? Be because beach day and those personalized projects are SEL days. It's how you get to have a relationship with your teacher, how you get, so I think how you bond as a class or whatnot, spend time with your friends. And I think we have to be careful when we're cutting things out that we don't cut out things that make uh, students want to come to school. Andrea, I think I think everybody's all set. So you'll send us our certificates via email. <laughs> there is a link in the chat to the um, um, an exit slip or whatever. I'm drawing a blank. It's six. Survey. Yes, yeah, survey. Thank you. So if everybody can do that, um, right. um, then we 
then we get I our certificates once those are completed, I believe. Right. You have to I do that to cool. get one. Um, how do you get it from the chat? Do you just click on it or yes. if, you, if you click on it, it will open up a window for you in your yes. It right. And how can you save it to use later? I always have trouble or will just, it just, just click on it and it'll open it should open up immediately. And I just have it open, but I it's always disappears. Well, you can copy and paste it. Okay. So I there's go hover next to it. You'll see three little dots. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then copy. I did that before. I don't know how I lose it, but I, and then. Open oh, your Google Drive and put it in the URL section. That's and, it. All right. I see will try that. Today. Thank you. I need the tech, great text person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's it. All right. Bye.